The Great Turkey Walk, Chapter 2 That wagon was nearly as good as new before another thought hit me about something I'd forgotten. It was a week or so later. In the meantime, I'd been to see Mr. Buffy and arranged to buy up his turkeys, considering as how I was doing the man a favor, getting all them hungry birds off his back. He didn't make it easy on me. Oh, he'd stop laughing right enough as soon as he laid his peepers on the color of my money. But then he set into scheming. You want the pleasure of destroying my birds, Simon Green. It's all right by me. He eyed the bills in my hand again. But these ain't your usual whites. These is bronze turkeys, worth a good deal more than what you be offering. Well, I knew they was bronze turkeys all along. Wasn't colorblind, was I? That's another reason I took to Mr. Buffy's flock from the start. His birds shimmered in the sunlight. With that touch of green, they was the closest thing to peacocks in our parts. Also, I knew for a fact, they was better natured than whites. Had much calmer dispositions. They be a sight easier to walk. Won't do no good trying to up the price on me, Mr. Buffy, which is what he was trying to do. I caught the signs right enough. Hadn't I watched Uncle Lucas haggle for years? Underneath the feathers, turkeys is turkeys, and I'm offering top market value fair and square, the same figure you gave me not three days past. He spit in frustration. Didn't know we was bargaining three days past, did I? Take it or leave it, Mr. Buffy. That's also what Uncle Lucas would say next, turning away a little, like he hardly cared. I followed suit. There be a few other flocks in these parts. Might just have a look at them. The man struggled mightily. Then his hand reached out to snatch the money. I pulled it back. Not yet, Mr. Buffy. When I'm set to go, you'll get your money. You want these birds? You take them off my hands now. You feed them till you're set to go. You find another buyer betwixt times, Mr. Buffy. You sell them for a better price. He spit again and shoved his twitching fingers into a pocket. He knew the same as me. There wasn't any other buyer to be found. So I had my birds. But that other thought that had been bothering me came again. It came so strong I missed a hammer blow and half mashed my thumb. I stuck it in my mouth and sucked. Somebody had to drive the feed wagon. But somebody had to herd the turkeys, too. And wasn't no way I could be two places at the self same time. Oh, dear, I'm gonna need me a drover. I set down the hammer and headed straight to town on Sparky. There, I learned as how word of my doings had been getting around. Wasn't much else transpiring in our piece of Missouri, so it only made sense. I knew how fast it spread when the townsfolk saw me coming and started in nudging each other, the way my cousins tended to do. A few of the older fellows who had been to school with me and graduated long since commenced the torture. Well, hey, looky-see. It's simple Simon the turkey boy. Simon green, long and lean, nothing in his head but birds and beans. Ignoring the lot of them, I continued past the county courthouse to swing off Sparky in front of the general store. The usual layouts were lounging in front, whittling and spitting. Morning, I offered. I got a few grunts from my efforts. I tried again. Morning. I'm looking for a mule skinner. Know anybody that'd be needing work? Charlie Kent set down his whittling knife to poke at Ed Heller. What you say, Ed? Boy asked a civil question. Who do we know can skin mules? Ed Heller cackled. Funny you should ask, since the top mule skinner in these parts 
ain't but a stone's throw away from us. Know anybody else that's been on the Santa Fe Trail? Charlie Kent cackled right back. You referring to Bidwell Peace? Who else might I be referring to, Charlie? I cleared my throat. <clears throat> Mighty kind of you to come up with a name, gentlemen. Any idea where I might find this Mr. Peace? A sudden ruckus from behind me broke the morning's tranquility. I turned to watch the sorriest specimen of humanity I'd ever seen being propelled through the saloon doors, right off the boardwalk and into the dust of the street. Charlie and Ed pointed and roared. The man lay there in a jumble of loose arms and legs. The next minute, another projectile came through the same swinging doors. This one was yelping. Naturally, I went over to give them both a hand. Looked as if they needed it. I started with the man. Mr. Peace? What? Red-rimmed eyes stared up at me. I hefted him upright, dusted him down. Mr. Bidwell, peace. He ran calloused hands through his thinning gray hair. In person, last I noticed. He staggered back against the saloon wall. What can I do for you, boy? It's work I've got for you, sir, I answered. Work, and maybe a little adventure, if you'd honor me by considering it. With effort, Mr. Peace stood a little taller. He still was a mighty smallish sort of man, but there looked to be some wire beneath the skin, just needed to be tensed into shape again. Consider anything, he mumbled. If you was to buy me a drink first. I steered him away from the saloon. Strong drink weakens a man, Mr. Peace, sir. You come along with me and we'll have us a nice talk. Somehow I managed to get him a top sparky. I led him back to the farm. The second critter turned out to be a small, short-haired, black-and-white dog. He trailed behind us, tail between his legs. It took three days to dry out Mr. Peace. I set him in the bed of my wagon and just kept working around him. Of course, I had to tie him up to keep him there. Gag him, too, when he got to ranting and raving. Ain't Maybell wouldn't have approved of the noise or the man. Once each day, I loosed the bonds and carried him down to the cow pond and threw him in for a dip. On the third day, he came out spluttering and mad as a wet hen. What in tarnation's going on? Who are you? So then we had to have introductions all over again. His eyes weren't red anymore. Fact of the matter is, they turned out a sharp blue. Sober. Mr. Bidwell Peace weren't no man's fool. He was still weak as a kitten, though. I snuck some food from the kitchen to feed him up. Then we really talked. First thing he asked after was Emmett. Who's Emmett? My little black and white dog. See him around? I gave a whistle. Emmett trotted up. Well, you never seen anything like the look on that dog's face when he saw his master in his right mind again? Sheer happiness. His tail set into wagging at last. Of course, Mr. Peace, he lit up like he'd died and gone to his reward, too. They fooled around some, and then we got back down to business. Turkey and Denver business. When I finished my story... Mr. Peace wiped his face from all those doggy kisses and walked over to Sparky and Snowball, standing in their corral. Straight off, he checked their teeth. These is fine mules you got here, Simon. Appreciate it. Raised them myself. He moved on to Brown Boy and Rocky. Young and strong. Got lots of pull in him. I was figuring on that. Plenty enough pull for the 800 miles or so to Denver, seems to me. He was still stretched over the railing. 
with the right skinner, of course. Course! He ran a hand down the nearest flank. My mules weren't skittish with him at all. Not the way they was with Uncle Lucas and the cousins. Such fine animals deserve the best. My way of thinking precisely, Mr. Peace. Might be time to move on anyhow, he muttered to himself. Then he turned to me. What you offering as pay, boy? To the right man? To the right man. I considered, even though I'd been considering the subject for the entire three days I'd been ministering to Mr. Peace, finally I spoke up. I'd want my Skinner to love my mules first. I'd want him to treat them right, on account of they're better than most human beings. He nodded. Agreed. On all counts. Next, I'd want my Skinner to have an interest in the enterprise. Seems to me if he had an interest, a deep interest, in getting there safe and sound. I caught his eyes. Not only him, but all of us. Me and the birds, too. Mr. Peace nodded again. Well, then, for such a person, it seemed to me that a working partnership might prove useful. What kind of partnership, boy? A percentage kind of partnership. Miss Rogers had been giving me a little extra tutoring this last week. Business-type tutoring at night, so's I wouldn't get gulled come Denver. A percentage instead of wages. Fact of the matter is, I had in mind 5% of the bird's selling price. I waited for his response. He was obviously calculating it in his head, already knowing what the birds were worth in Denver. I hadn't minded telling him. The whole rest of the county knew it, too. They just never figured I'd make it to Denver to pick up my money. Bidwell Peace did a little more accounting on his fingers, then looked up at last. That's a couple years' pay for a couple months' work. Then you have to figure on you putting up the capital and coming up with the idea to begin with. He shook his head. Then again, I get me that far west. What's to keep me from starting a new life? He paused. And I ain't never been greedy, but a little more money'd help me out with that. True. I studied the man again and decided. You keep shaping up, Mr. Peace. We might just talk about 10% come Denver. I stopped. Might just. He held out his hand. You got a deal, son. We shook on it. Emmett came over and rubbed against my leg. First time, even though I'd been feeding him for three days. I got my wagon brim full up with shelled corn. Mr. Peace and I rigged a covering over the corn so it wouldn't all scatter come the first bad piece of road. We rigged a roof over the whole thing, too. There was just enough space between the corn and the roof tarpaulin to stow our bedrolls and a few pots and vittles. There'd be enough to shelter come bad weather, too. All that was left was a leaving in the morning. Nine hundred and ninety-eight, nine hundred and ninety-nine, one thousand. There, Mr. Buffy started swinging his wooden gate shut against the last of his flock still swarming behind him. Hold up, Mr. Buffy. I shoved my hand out to stop the gate. I only counted nine hundred and ninety-five. You owe me five more birds. No such thing, Simon Green. He put his weight to his side of the gate. Ain't my fault you can't count. Bidwell Peace added his wiry strength to my own against our side. You're both off, but ten entire birds. I counted nine hundred and ninety. Mr. Buffy started seeing red. Now look here. I ain't going to be flamboozled by any half-wit. In town drunk, I ain't. One moment, please, gentlemen. Miss Rogers stepped into the fray. She had come to see me off 
and her lifetime savings, too. My, but she looked fresh and fetching in her sky-blue summer frock and bonnet. She smiled at all of us. In point of fact, my count was 985. I believe you owe Simon another 15 birds, Mr. Buffy. The crowd behind Miss Rogers set in to chucklin'. Half the district had turned out for the event this morning, and each and every one of them had a different tally on my birds. But being as Miss Rogers was the only school teacher amongst them, they stood up for her expertise, even if they didn't know it was her money behind me. Nobody knew but the two of us and the town of Union's bank president. We thought we'd leave it that way. Give him his full count, Buffy. It needs to be a fair shake. Why the crowd had taken such interest had nothing to do with me personal. They was betting on how many turkeys I'd be getting to Denver. Even Miss Rogers had allowed as to how it was, on the whole, a more salutary occupation of their minds. Mr. Buffy eased up on his side of the gate, trying to bankrupt me, the lot of you. But I got my 15 birds still due. So there I stood in the middle of the dirt road, surrounded by 1,000 turkeys, guaranteed by Miss Rogers herself. I counted out the $250 of final time and handed it over to Mr. Buffy. He grabbed at it, counted it all over again, then stomped off in the direction of his barn, not even a thank you very kindly. Nice doing business with you, Mr. Buffy, I sang out. The crowd laughed and spread out from my flock. The turkeys, they just stood there staring at the new sights, gobbling with as much interest as they were able. Mr. Peace pulled himself up the wagon seat and picked up the reins. You about ready, son? I took a final glance around. Aunt Maybell and Uncle Lucas and the cousins were at the edge of the throng. I nodded to them. Say you don't forget that mule money, Simon, Cousin Ned called over. And the feed money, Uncle Lucas added. You got her address writ down the way I said? Aunt Mabel asked. So's you can send it to us first thing? So much for ten years of my life. All they'd be missing was the money due. I nodded again. They was already heading off to their own wagon, shaking their heads. The other farmers were drifting away, too. That left Miss Rogers. Suddenly, I felt a little pang of something. Deep down inside, didn't mind seeing the backs of the rest of them, but Miss Rogers, ma'am, Simon, dear, she came right over and gave me a hug. It was a proper hug. She sure did smell clean and good. I'm relying on you, Simon, she murmured, and I'm trusting you every step of the way. Praying for you, too, just for good measure. Thank you, ma'am. Miss Rogers stood back to look me over a final time. She studied me long and hard, not even noticing one of my turkeys pecking at her kid's skin boots. I gave it a little shove with my foot. You're really growing up, Simon, truly spreading your wings. Don't you ever let anybody make fun of you, or your enterprise on this trip. They'll only be saying things from jealousy because you're doing something and they're not. You're going to make a fine job of it. Going to be a fine man one day. She pressed something into my hand. Here, save this for grave emergencies and for sending me a message when you arrive. Her eyes twinkled. You send me an exact amount of how many birds you walk all the way to Denver, Simon. Understand? Yes, ma'am, Miss Rogers, I understand fine. I pocketed the money. Then I bent down to Emmett, waiting patiently at my feet. I rubbed behind his ears where he liked to be rubbed. I whispered into the closest ear. All right now, Emmett. 
Never you mind that these birds are all bigger than you. You're smarter, and you're in charge of the left flank. I'll take on the right, just like we practiced with them chickens back at the farm. Emmett yipped with excitement. I'm ready, Mr. Peace, I hollered when I straightened up again. Emmett and the birds, they're ready too. Mr. Peace let out a whoop, and we commenced the great turkey walk. End of chapter 2